forgot to turn my mic on. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> it's a good to, to uh, be back with y'all a couple weeks uh, off. Uh, no, I was off one week. I was in Cambridge or Overland the other week and when Trevor preached. And so it's kind of good to be back. I'll be honest, like I felt a little like rusty this week. I was like, man, got to get, get my act together here. And so I hope this goes smooth and uh, you um, are, are edified by God's word. We're going to be in 1 Samuel today, chapters 1 and 2. We are four weeks into our series on fascinating stories of forgotten lives, people that maybe we don't think about, that if I was to say, hey, what's your top 10 list of people from the Bible? Most of these folks probably aren't going to be on your list. And today we are um, talking about Hannah, the mother of Samuel. She's our, our fourth person person here uh, across the, the back, and um, I think we're going to see a really beautiful, tender, um, faithful picture in the life of Hannah this morning. Um, she was in a situation that I think some, many of us, maybe all of us, have found ourselves in in one time or another, and that is she longed for something deep within her that she knew she couldn't provide for herself. Have you found yourself in that position? There's something in your life that's missing or wrong or, or whatever it may be, and it just is like deep within you, you long for this thing to be as it should, but you know you are helpless in the matter. Have you found yourself there? Maybe you're there today. I know I have. I've been in those seasons where there's this thing, and I just like, there's nothing I can do about it, but man, my heart just cries out for it. And that is, that's where she is at. And so the question I want us to ask ourselves is how do we respond when we're in that position? When we're in that, that position of, of that longing helplessness, how, how do we respond? I want to start, though, with the story of a man named Hani. He was a first century Jewish man. His uh, story is recorded in, in a book uh, in, in history somewhere, but um, uh, in recent times, a man named Mark Batterson highlighted his story in a book called Circle Maker. Um, and Hani was um, a first century Jewish man who was known for, for his prayer life. Well, they, in this region, were experiencing a drought, a drought that had been well over a year since they had had any kind of rain. And I'm, I'm certain that Hani had been praying about the drought, but at some point, things sort of broke for Hani, and he decided he was going to do something drastic. And so he went out into the, uh, the middle of the village, and he took his staff with him, and he, he turned a circle while drawing a circle in the dirt with his staff. And after he had drawn the circle, he dropped to his knees and he declared for everybody to hear. He said, God, I am not moving until it rains. And he dropped to his knees and began to pray. And he was committed to staying inside his circle and praying for rain until it rained. And sure enough, in due time, it rained. And I think about that, and I think about that, that story of, of being so committed to something that you would draw that circle in the sand and say, God, I'm not moving until this happens. That is, that is a level of commitment that I don't know if you've ever had. It's hard for me to imagine. But that was his response to a drought, a thing that, that he was longing for that their community needed, I'm sure, and that he was helpless to provide. But he knew he could go pray. He knew that he could come before God and pray a very persevering, diligent, committed prayer. And that is what Hani did. And I, I ask myself, is there anything in my life that I have wanted, that I have longed for, that I, I trusted God so much for that I was willing to circle it in my life? That's pretty big, isn't it? <clears throat> Today, we're going to see a woman who circled it. In fact, I wonder if Hani didn't get it from, from Hannah. If, if how Hannah conducted herself was an inspiration for Hani several centuries later and how he dealt with that various situation. So if you would turn with me to 1 Samuel, it's in your Old Testament. Um, 
it's, it's actually was originally, we have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. It was really written as one book, um, but because of the way scrolls work and just the amount of space on the paper, they split it into two parts. And so this is the first part of the first part of Samuel as we start in chapter 1. Let's just start in verse 1. So there was a man from Rame, uh sorry, I practiced this and then I messed it up. Ramatham Zophim from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. He was the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the first was Hannah. The name of the second was Penina. Now Penina had children, but Hannah was childless. Year after year, this man would go up from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. It was there that the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, served as the Lord's priests. Okay, so I want to stop there because this has given us the setting for our story. We have this man. We're given his name, Elkanah. We're given his, his lineage, and a quite extensive lineage, if you notice. And I, this tells me something. This tells me that he is an honorable man. This tells me that he, he is a faithful man because we get four generations of his lineage. And that he's an Ephraimite, that means he is from central Israel. He's an Israelite. And we, we get the fact that he has two wives, Hannah and Penina. We'll talk about that here in a moment. One has children. Wife number two has children. Wife number one does not. We're going to get into that. That's kind of the first problem, if you will, so to speak, that this passage is going to be addressing. And then we're introduced to their faithfulness and year after year going to worship at Shiloh with, with a, a, a priest named Eli and his two sons. Now, I want to jump over real quick to chapter 2. So if you just turn your page with me to chapter 2, verse 12, because we're going to learn a lot about these three real fast that it's going to tell us about this setting. It's going to tell us more about what's happening in this passage. And so let's go chapter 2, verse 12. It says, the sons of Eli were wicked men. That's not a good start. So Hophni and Phinehas are described as evil men or wicked men. They did not recognize the Lord's authority. Now, maybe your Bible says they did not know God. It's this idea that in all of their priestly training that they had gotten, they probably knew a lot about God, but they didn't know him. And they certainly didn't recognize his authority in a way of obeying and following him and serving him faithfully. These were men who had a position, but didn't have faith. It's not a good position. It reminds me, of a statement my father-in-law made to me one time. My father-in-law, he went to seminary um, right after Deborah and I got married. Um, he retired, and he felt called into ministry, and so he retired from Sprint and went to and moved to the weekend before our wedding and after they moved to, back to, uh, to Texas, and he started in seminary. A different seminary than I went to, but he went to seminary. And I remember partway through seminary, um, he told me, he said, Jeff, you know one of the most frustrating things about seminary is that I believe for some of my professors, God is a little more than a subject to study, that they don't actually know God. They just know a lot about him. And I remember at that time being shocked by that. How could that be? That these, these professors are seminary professors, and yet that is how Larry, a very faithful guy, a very diligent guy, was describing them. I thought, oh. Part of why I didn't go to that seminary, if I'm honest. But I also know how common that can be for us. How much we can know about God, and we can fall into the trap of not knowing God. We can answer the questions. We can fill in the blanks. We can answer the Bible trivia. We've memorized that one or that one. We know the right answer when the question is asked. But if we were asked, do we know God as if we know a person that you're sitting next to or with or someone else in your life, this, this personal knowledge and understanding, there are many people that would not. These, these men are in an interesting position because they are priests, 
They're in a a leadership kind of role, and they're being described this way, but all of us can fall into this trap one way or the other. And so this is not... This is not a good setting. The, the place where they are going to worship, the place that actually has the tabernacle of the Lord at this point in time, that's not where it should have been, but that's where it was, was at this place where Eli and these two sons are serving. And this is their description, how God is describing them. And he goes on in verse 13, he says, Now the priests would always treat the people in the following way, meaning these, these two guys, this is how they would treat the people who would come to worship. Whenever anyone was making a sacrifice, while the meat was boiling, the priest attendant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would jab it into the basin, kettle, a cauldron, or pot, or whatever it was boiling in, and whatever um, and everything that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they used to do to all the Israelites when they came to Shiloh. Even before they burned the fat, The priest attendant would come and say to the person who was making the sacrifice, hand over some meat for the priest to roast. He won't take boiled meat from you, but only raw meat. If the individual said to them, first let the fat be burned away, and then take for yourself whatever you wish, he would say, no, hand it over right now, and if you don't, I will take it by force. So, Just so we're clear, the priests were allowed some of the meat for themselves. That's how they were provided for in terms of their food. But there was very clear protocol to this, that the meat was to be sacrificed. It was to be put in the fire. The fatty parts were always to be burned away first for the Lord. That was part of the, the, the primary sacrifice, if you will, to the Lord. The, the fatty parts were to be, to be sacrificed first and burned away first. And then afterwards, they were to take whatever of the meat was left after that part of the process, and they could have a portion, and there were specific portions, part of the breast meat, and part of the right leg. I don't know why the left leg not, but the right leg. Okay, that's just what it says. And so that's what they were allowed, were to take some of those portions of the meat for themselves. Now, clearly, in this protocol, the sacrifice that was given to the Lord was to be the focus, right? This person has come, and part of their worship was to bring this sacrifice. And so this is like, this is what they are viewing as this is my, my connection, what's making me right with God. And so I bring this with my focus being on God and making this relationship right. And the priest is swooping in and saying, no, give this part to me when he shouldn't have it, even to the point of if you don't, agree to, I will forcibly take it. You see what everything that's wrong with this, right? That's what these two guys were up to. That's the kind of demeanor that they were conducting themselves with. Their ministry was about themselves, not about ministry. Verse 17 is a telling sentence. The sin of these young men was very great in the, sight, in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offering with contempt. So we get, we get a picture, we get a sort of a temperature of the room, if you will. That here we have this couple, we have the, the setting laid out for us, we have this couple, and actually a couple couples, right, Elkina and both of his wives, and one is, has, has children, one does not, and they are going up year after year faithfully to worship in this place where the priests are not faithful. Now, you and I, we're sitting here, and rightfully so, kind of gasping at the behavior of these three guys, right? Particularly the two sons. But here's what we must understand, and, and beings that we're kind of jumping around in this series, we can miss this easily. This first Samuel, this, this, the first paragraphs of first Samuel is coming on the heels, uh, chronologically speaking, of what happened in the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is this spiraling downwards of faithfulness to God and faithfulness to God in the, amongst all the people, but especially the leadership, the judges, the ones who were the leaders of the community. And so what we've had over the last, uh, you know, however many years of the book of Judges leading to this place is a culture that has just spiraled out of control downwards to unfaithfulness and unfaithfulness and unfaithfulness. And so the unfortunate part is that the people who are out of place here aren't Hophni and Phinehas. It's Hannah and Elkinah and Penina. They're the ones that are out of place. The faithful ones 
are the ones that don't quite fit in their culture. Not these two guys that have totally twisted what they should be doing. So let's flip back over to chapter 1, pick up where we left off. Now that we kind of have the scene set here, we have two problems identified. The one is we have these corrupt priests. And the second is we have a woman named Hannah who is childless. And that's a big deal in their culture. Children were viewed as a blessing. Not having children was viewed as a curse from God. And so this is the tension that's happening. And by the way, the the reason why Elkanah probably had a second wife was because children, particularly sons, was one's wealth, one's insurance, one's prosperity, one's um, um, kind of ability to stay alive down the road. And so when, if, if Hannah was not having children, he would go have a second wife so that he could have children. He could have that security. God doesn't um, recommend this, but that was common practice, and that's what they did, and that's what he appears to have done. And so here we go, verse 4. Whenever the day came for Elkanah <coughs> to sacrifice, he used to give meat portions to his wife Penina and all of her sons and daughters, and he would, but he would give a double portion to Hannah because he especially loved her. Now the Lord had not enabled her to have children. Her rival wife, that statement right there says a lot, doesn't it? Used to upset her and make her worry, for the Lord had not enabled her to have children. Penina would behave this way year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the Lord's house, Penina would upset her so that she would weep and refuse to eat. Finally, her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and not eat? Why are you so sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Um, Let's stop here for a moment. The men were required to go up for the annual sacrifice. The women were not, and the children were not. The fact that Elkanah was taking all of his family with him, that's a sign of his faithfulness. The fact that the wives would go, particularly Hannah, as we look at this passage, Hannah goes and she um, seems to very much like this is an important thing for her every year. An important event says something about her and her faith. Hannah's barrenness did not diminish Elkanah's love for her. That's, That's fascinating, especially in this culture. When, when they could have easily viewed her as her purpose was to have children, and if you can't do that, then she can be pushed aside. He did not. He, he still loved her. He still, um, she, he, he obviously was investing in her deeply, caring for her even in the midst of this. And by the way, men, this is a good point for us to, to stop a moment and recognize that our wives are not perfect, and neither are their husbands. And we can love each other great anyway, right? That our imperfections don't give us an excuse to not love one another well. Elkanah is is giving us a good example in this. That he was still loving her very well. And I know for many people, this story hits home because many people have fought infertility the struggle to have kids. And we look at this and we know that their cultural understanding of this was a blessing and curse that God kind of being for or against them in, in terms of being able to have children. Can we just be clear that that is not true? That's how they saw it. That's how they understood it. But that's not the, not the case. That just as it says, God had not allowed her to have kids yet. God has all kinds of reasons for doing what he does or not doing what he doesn't do that we may never understand, and that's okay. But just as Hannah, as we're going to see, she remained faithful to him, even in the midst of this longing of her soul to have children and this cultural pressure of why she wasn't having children, she still remained faithful to him, knowing that she would have a child whenever he deemed it the right time. So I want to encourage any of you that are having that struggle to be encouraged by that. We see that Penina wasn't exactly helpful in this, was she? That the word rival in the way that Penina would kind of poke at her as to I have kids and you don't, poke, 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 poke. And clearly this was really hurtful 
to Hannah. And that she, she really is grieving this. She is struggling with this. That you almost see like this, this depression upon her. That where, where she is she's struggling with why is this? And she didn't, didn't quite get it. And that's, that's okay. It's a hard thing to understand as we just said. And so year after year, they went up, and, and she went, and she would make this sacrifice. That tells us this isn't just a short season. We read this in a couple moments. This might have been years or decades happening to where she would have gone up, and she, she would continue to go up and, and, and sacrifice and, and be prayerful and go before the Lord, start drawing the circle around this thing in her life before the Lord. And we get this, this snippet of her going up to the temple, but I'm, I'm positive she was doing this daily, right? That she had this circle in her life daily of how she could take this before the Lord. And uh, guys, another note for us here, verse 8. I love Alcana's heart trying to encourage his wife. Verse 8 isn't helpful, though, is it? I mean, think about what he just said. Hey, why do you need kids? You got me, and I'm pretty awesome. Aren't I better than 10? Probably not, right? So let's think about our words, what we say before we say them. Good, okay. (laughs) Verse 9. On one occasion in Shiloh, so when they had gone up to worship, after they had finished eating and drinking, Hannah got up. Now at the time, Eli the priest was sitting in his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. So in in the room. And she was very upset as she prayed to the Lord. And she was weeping uncontrollably. She made a vow to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will look with compassion on the suffering of your female servant, remember me and not forgetting your servant. And give a male child to your servant. Then I will dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life. And his hair will never be cut. Here she is in this private moment with the Lord. And she's in anguish over this. She's, she's weeping uncontrollably. We can, we can sense the depth of this, right? And, and she, makes, she makes a vow to the Lord. Just the two of them, her and God, she makes a vow. God, if you, will, if you will give me a son, I will give him to you. I will give him back to you. His entire life will be yours. Now, priests usually started their service after their schooling and their, their apprenticeships at about age 25. So she's saying he will start right away. We're going to see later that when, when he is weaned away from her, when she no longer, he's not dependent upon her to be fed, she, she gives him, so like age three, she's starting way ahead. She's totally making this commitment. She's willing to give this, this boy that she's asking for his life to the Lord. And she's doing so with such a way, it says her hair will never be cut. That's part of a Nazarite vow. That's something that um, Samson did before now, Right? And the interesting thing is his mother struggled to get pregnant too. And we've seen that throughout scripture. She does, she's doing something similar, making a promise similar, saying a Nazarite vow in which he would basically not just only be a priest, but be a priest that makes even extra commitments of faithfulness to the Lord. That's what she's offering. Now, <clears throat> this is... And this is nice. We read about this and, and we're like, wow, she's like, she's so committed. She's so um, like faithfulness that she's, she's making a vow. She's making a promise to God about this child. If you give me, I will give you. But let's admit for a second, this is a little risky to make, to make a deal with God. And the reason why this is risky is because he has a better memory than you do. In that moment... She could easily say, God, if you do, I will, and then forget about it. We need to be careful when we do this sort of thing with God. Because many times we're actually doing this not out of faithfulness, but out of manipulation. We're hoping that we can manipulate God into doing whatever it is we want him to do. And so we play, let's make a deal. We shouldn't do this casually. Just like any other vow we might take at a wedding or something like that, we, we need to be careful with the vows we make, the promises we make, the, the covenants we create with God, and make sure that we are doing it with 
with the proper heart. You notice she's asking for something quite unique. If you give me a child, I will give him back. It doesn't quite make sense, does it? But that's, that's what she's asking. It gives, gives this appearance, and we'll see with the story as she gets the opportunity to follow through. Is she, is she doing this self-centeredly or focused on him? Is she asking for the child because simply, I want a child, or is she offering because she wants it for God's glory? And so she has made this request here in this moment before the Lord. And now verse 12, as she continued praying to the Lord, Eli was watching her mouth move as she was praying. Now Hannah was speaking from her heart, and although her lips were moving, her voice was inaudible. He couldn't hear what she was saying. And therefore he thought she was drunk. So he came to her and said to her, how often do you intend to get drunk? Put away your wine. Says a little something about his perceptiveness, doesn't it? But Hannah replied, that's not the way it is, my Lord. I am under a great deal of stress. I have drunk neither wine nor beer. Rather, I have poured out my soul to the Lord. You get the irony, right? Not pouring out wine, but pouring out her heart. Don't consider your servant a wicked woman, for until now I have spoken from my deep pain and anguish. <clears throat> Eli replied, oh, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> go, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the request that you have asked of him. You notice Eli doesn't even know what she asked for, right? And she said, may I, your servant, find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and got something to eat, and her face no longer looked sad. Even though Eli, being kind of blind in this moment, a lack of spiritual discernment, she feels like God has heard her. She is at peace with this. Even in the midst of this exchange, she has this peace that God has, has heard her. And obviously, she doesn't know what the outcome is going to be, but, but she has this, this peace come over her. And then in verse 19, they, meaning her and Elkanah, I assume, got up early the next morning, and after worshiping the Lord, they returned to their home at Ramah. Elkanah had marital relations with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, thinking, I asked the Lord for him. Now Samuel means the name of God. That's that's the name, name of God. But it sounds like the phrase asked for God, asked from God. And so she's kind of doing a play on words here with his name. God answers her prayer. God has held up his end of the little bargain, right? The question now is, will she hold up hers? So we go to verse 21. This man, Elkanah, went up with his family to make the yearly sacrifice to the Lord and to keep his vow. So from just a couple of verses ago, a year at least has passed, right? Okay, so he's now going to go up. Um, but Hannah did not go with him. Uh-oh, is this a bad sign? Instead, she told her husband, once the boy, is, the boy is weaned, I will bring him and appear before the Lord, and he will remain there from now on, from that point on. So she's not pulling back from her promise. She just knows the child is not ready. He's still dependent upon her. So she's waiting until that time. So her husband, Elkanah, said to her, do what you think is best. Stay until you have been weaned, or until you have weaned him. May the Lord fulfill his promise. So the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Once she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with three bulls and ephah of flour, and a container of wine. She brought him to the Lord's house at Shiloh, and even though he was young, once, the, once the, the bull had been slaughtered, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said, Just as surely as you are alive, my Lord, I am the woman who previously stood here with you in order to pray to the Lord. I prayed for this boy, and the Lord has given me the request that I asked of him. Now I dedicate him to the Lord, and from this time on, he is dedicated to the Lord." And they worshiped the Lord there. So what's kind of interesting here is he's probably two or three years old. 
She takes him up. She brings the bulls, but she, but which, by the way, they only required one bull, and she brought three. I think it's a gift to Eli. Can you imagine him? He wakes up this morning without a kid. And today he has a kid in the house. And these bulls are part of kind of their, their payment, so to speak. The flour, five pounds of flour and the wine. I'm sorry, five gallons of flour and the wine. And she follows through on the commitment. She comes and worships, brings the child, gives him to Eli, gives him to the Lord and said, he is, he is yours. He is to be here now. She has followed through on her promise. God did his part. She followed through with her part. Now, again, let's step back a moment and think about this. The reason why having a son was so important was for their legacy, for their security, for their future, right? And so they've been longing for a son. God gives them a son, and immediately they give the son back to God. So in some ways, like, they didn't benefit at all, did they? But yet they were faithful. Absolutely faithful. This thing that they had been longing for in their life, this thing that they had drawn a circle around for however many years of their life, God followed through. And then they followed through in faithfulness by giving back. Their, their only son they gave back. Reminds us of Jesus, doesn't it? The only son that was given for us. They willingly gave up for God's glory. God willingly gave up for us, for us to come to be with him. Not so that we could check the box of of, of our salvation, not just so that we could be, be satisfied with, with our place, but for his glory. So that as we come to faith, as we follow him, he receives the glory. Such beautiful parallels. And as this, this happens, now Hannah gives us this beautiful song at the beginning of chapter 2. We don't have time to go through this today, but <clears throat> I would encourage you to read through it because essentially what is happening in this song is she, is she is sort of summarizing the entire rest of the book of Samuel, first and second Samuel. She is laying out what is going to happen in her worship and her praise for God and what, is, what he has done to be so faithful to her. Her response is this praise, this worship, and it is laying out what is ahead in, in a beautiful way that only like the biblical authors can do for us, right? They're so good at that. And so then we have the passage we already read about the priests, and then we go to verse 18, and we have this paragraph that goes into further detail about Hannah and Elkanah and, and Samuel and how faithful they were and how they would come as a family with their, with their once-a-year sacrifice, and she would bring Samuel a robe that he would wear. And we get these kind of alternating paragraphs of, you know, 12 through 18 or 12 through 17 is about the, the priests and the sons. And then we have one about um, Hannah and Elkanah and, the, and Samuel. And then now in verse 22, we come back to about Eli and his sons and that their unfaithfulness gets even worse to where now they, they're having sex in the temple with women who are, who are working, we presume, in the temple. And they're defaming the temple in this way and, and defaming their position in this way. And we're getting this alternating contrast between these two families. One of extreme faithfulness and one of extreme unfaithfulness. And in this paragraph here about Eli and his sons, we, Eli is told about what his sons are doing. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking either this guy is totally asleep at the wheel or he's been covering it up the whole time. And so at best, Eli is ignorant. And at worst, he's just like they are. Either one isn't good. And God, God brings this to Eli's attention. Eli confronts them. And they disobey their father. They totally just ignore him. And say, we're not going to listen. We're going to keep doing what we want to do. Their pride, their evil is so deeply rooted. 
And God declares in that paragraph that he is going to kill them. It's not going to end well for them. And then verse 26, we kind of get this, this close to the contrast with the statement that the boy Samuel was growing up and finding favor both in the Lord and with people. This idea of his, his growing, his maturity, that he was being faithful and they weren't. And then verses 27 to the end of chapter 2, we get the consequences for Eli and his sons play out in a very ugly way. And it ends with this picture that if you miss it, or if, you don't, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. And remember, they were stealing the meat from the people. And it ends with the statement that all of their descendants will be such that they will be begging for bread. This contrast of the meat that was God's that they were taking, and now the descendants will be beggars for bread because of what they have done. This, this contrast between these two families. So as we started this passage, we had two problems, right? One was the priests, and one was childlessness. The first, the priests, through this passage, we, we have a replacement for the priestly lineage. One has ended, one lineage has ended, and a new has begun with Samuel, with the overlap of all three, the two sons and Samuel, all growing up in Eli's house, in Eli's home under his care and his tutelage. But one lineage has ended and a new has begun. Those who had been entrusted with the faith were unfaithful. And so now a new generation, a new man has, is being brought up and is being faithful. And it, it should cause us to ask the question that even though we aren't priests in the temple as they were, are we being faithful what God has entrusted to us? That this, this little part of God's kingdom, this little part of the world, this little part of influence that God has entrusted to you and I, whatever it may look like for each of us, are we being faithful with it or are we not? Are we, are we taking God's favor and simply using it for our benefit, for our glory, like they were? Are we simply just using it for what I want to do with it? Or are we stewarding it well for his glory as it should be? God has used this situation with two sons who who were poor stewards, who were unfaithful, to be replaced with a man who would go on to be a priest. He would be the last of Israel's judges. And his story is just incredible how he graciously goes from, from, from nothing to judge and willingly helps shepherd the transition to kings, even though he knows it's a bad idea just like God does. He shepherds the, 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 the people to kings. He is a prophet in that manner. And then he lowers himself back to just simply be a counselor to the first two kings, Saul and David. What an incredible man who has been brought into this place. What's interesting is his testimony, these two chapters we just read, the testimony of his birth is longer than Saul's and David's put together because we don't get anything for theirs. It tells you the importance of him and this role he is playing. But the reality is the testimony of his birth is the story of his mother and her faithfulness. And it introduces this this new hope for Israel in this time of extreme darkness. Her faithfulness, her willingness to draw a circle around this and to stand there faithfully. And then when God answered to follow through faithfully, not just to take for herself, but to follow through faithfully. And one of the passages that we kind of summarize and skipped over, God gives her more children, by the way. Beautiful is that. But she was faithful. She proved herself faithful. His story is a story of her faithfulness. And in that way, we get this contrasting example with problem number two with her and Eli. Where on one hand, we have at best a a parent who's not paying attention. Who's not being intentional at all with the raising of his children. 
or maybe worse, to on the other side, a woman who is diligent, who is intentional, who's faithful in her parenting, even when the child lives in somebody else's home, diligent in her prayer life, circling I'm sure Samuel, before he was born and after he was born even, and praying for him. And I'm sure there were lots of other areas of her life that she had that same faithfulness with. And I, I can only imagine her having, having experienced God's favor in this way and having been faithful and giving him back, that even in the years after when he would be with Eli, how, how often she went, would go back to that circle and pray for her son. How beautiful is that? What a contrast that is. She truly was a prayer warrior. And it wasn't a prayer warrior for her. It was for God's glory. You know, we we tend to be really good at being prayer warriors when we call it worry. That there's this thing, and I'm really praying about it because the fact of the matter is I'm really worrying about it. I'm just incredibly anxious. It's totally different when we are prayer warriors, because we know I can't do anything about this, and so I am handing it to you faithfully, Father, knowing that you're going to do whatever you choose with it, this, that, or the other. And I'm standing in this circle, holding it up to you. What a contrast she is to Eli. And the greatest joy of being a parent, in this case being a mother, is to raise a child who is dedicated to the Lord. Her goal wasn't to have a child to keep them. As parents, we can get confused with that sometimes, right? Especially we're in graduation season. For some of you, it, that's a hard month, isn't it? Because you're like, I don't, I don't want them to go. But that's, that's why we raised them. I remember my mom telling me that clearly when I was in high school. She's like, I didn't raise you this far to keep you here. You're going to go. She saw that vision. Hannah did too. Hers looked much different, right? Age two or three. But she knew she wasn't raising this kid to keep him. She was raising him to send him out. She was raising him to the Lord for his glory, not hers. And so she raised him with purpose. It's really important for us to understand as parents. So we learn a lot from Hannah. Hannah. She points us forward to the gospel, to where we we have to wrestle with Jesus, with the son that was given for us, that God didn't have to give, just like she didn't have to. By the way, Elkanah didn't have to let her either, and he was okay with it. The son that was given for us, what what are we going to do with Jesus? Are we going to refuse the gift? Are we going to selfishly accept the gift? Yes, I'll take Jesus because I want those benefits for me. Or are we we embracing the sun for his glory and how it shines through our lives? That's a biggie. We learn a lot from her in this way because we're all naturally really selfish. We can, we can have Jesus, and we can be like, yep, all for me, and not allow him to work through our lives. I challenge you with that today. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you do, and as you're sitting here thinking about it, it's really been about you. We learn from her that she understands the sustainer and the provider of everything she has is God. Not not her. So as we consider our lives, I want to ask you, is there something that that is missing, that's not right, that's out of place in your life, that that you, you realize today, maybe you need to go draw a circle around that thing. And in doing so, you're recognizing that only he can provide it. You're, you're admitting your helplessness, your inadequacy to provide whatever this thing is that it is you're longing for. Because frankly, if you could provide it, you probably would have by now, right? So w- when we draw the circle, we're, we're recognizing him and his provision, his, his place, his power. We're recognizing ours, our place in this equation. Is there something today 
that you need to draw a circle around. And you need to go stand in that circle and be committed to prayer in that circle. Check yourself, though, that it's not about your glory, but it's about his. That both the want and the prayer, the deals that you may be tempted to make, standing in that circle, that all of it is for his glory, not yours. And so I I want us to end, we always end in prayer, but I want us to end just a, a little different this morning. I want us to end with just some silent time. Because I think each of us need to spend a little time with the Father. And maybe today is when you need to draw your circle. Maybe you've had a circle for a long time and you're just going to come back to it now with some renewed hope, some renewed encouragement from the life of Hannah. But I just want us to spend some time in prayer. Silently, us and God. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, you know the cry of our hearts. You know those things that we've been longing for, maybe for years. Those things we've been wrestling with. Father, I I just want to acknowledge that you are faithful. You are true, you're loving, you're gracious and kind no matter what the answer is. And I I pray that as a church, our hearts are Hannah's, where we would go to you, acknowledging who you are, the great provider and sustainer, the one who knows the beginning from the end, who, who knows the plan. We'd come to you faithfully that our hearts would be, would be focused on you and your glory, not our own selfishness. Father, I pray that, um, that we each would, would have enough, um, an, enough passion, enough care, enough diligence, and, and whatever this is that you've placed on our hearts, that we would not, um, we'd not be quick to walk away but that we would persevere in praying. We'd not become discouraged. We wouldn't give up. Father, um, I I know from my life you have showed up um, in huge ways, in ways that just blow me away afterwards but the weight can be hard. So Father, I, I look forward to hearing the stories someday of your faithfulness from the places we've drawn circles. So Father, um, I thank you that you are so faithful and loving and that we can trust you to be that diligent. And so, Father, I ask all this in Jesus' name.